Hi, um, hello everyone. Welcome to this session of uh, our NPTEL course, Appreciating Linguistics, a Typological Approach. We are discussing um, morphological typology. In, my, in the previous session, uh, I did talk about how the stems, roots and affixes, they can be clubbed together following certain patterns to result in different kind of combinations of the words in natural languages. So, um, since it is about typology and we are talking about morphological typology, we just cannot restrict ourselves only with the combination of let us say uh, roots uh, like roots, stems um, or, or let us say full fledged uh, morphemes or, or we can say the independent morphemes or the, or the complete morphemes or you can say free morphemes. Rather, we need to find out what are the typological combinations possible when you are talking about affixes, which may not be an independent morpheme, which could be a dependent one, something like a, prep, something like a um, prefix or a suffix or a circumfix or an infix. There are also dupifix, right? So then um, in that case, we have to uh, now for, for today's discussion, my focus would be um, on typology of affixes. There are certain affixes which are um, overtly marked or which are overtly found in the words and there are certain affixes which do not manifest or which, which do not show up overtly uh, when we are talking about the words. So, the first typological distinction or the typological division in affixation would be um, overt versus zero affixes. So, when I say zero affixes, I am primarily talking about the affixes which are not overtly manifested. So, this typological difference uh, can be understood uh, from the examples that you that you see on the slides. Um, we have four different languages here. We have Latin, we have Southern Barvasano, then we have Swahili and then we have Mandarin. Uh, when I discuss the data over here, you need to find out which one uh, has or which language has overt affixes and which language has um, covert affixes or the zero affixes. Okay? Um, so, let us look at Latin first. So, the singular uh, look at the singular form of wife and then the plural form of wife. So, this is u x o r auxor or whatever. So, the whatever might be the pronunciation. So, then in the plural form there is an addition of an e s. Generally that is how in English also we, uh, we have the s marker or the e n marker or sometimes it is the e s marker. So, uh, if you look at the uh, counterpart of wife, the, the word wife, the Latin counterpart compare the singular with the plural. Um, you can clearly see there is an overt plural marker here. Similar is the case with um, Southern Barvasano. Here you see there is uh, um, when this is the singular form has an overt marker, but the plural form does not have it. So, this is kahe a is singular i and kahe is the plural i is right. It is just the other way around clear. So, in Latin singular does not have a marker, plural does have it. In Barisano, singular does not have a mark, uh, singular has a marker, but the plural does not have it. What happens in Swahili? In Swahili, it is a different story altogether. So, uh, here uh, the look at the word given for knife, it is ki su and when it is knives, it becomes vi su. So, the phonological form changes. So, ki seems to be the singular marker and v seems to be the plural marker. So, that is the Swahili type um, uh, affixation. Finally, we have Mandarin where um, the word for um, man is ren right? and the word for men is also ren. So, in this connection we see there are four different types of language that we have in hand uh, as far as the pluralization is concerned or the plural affixes are concerned. So, let us let us recap, let us recall what we have discussed. The first type is Latin type. In Latin the plural noun is, is overtly marked. So, there is an overt affix in Latin for the plural uh, marking. Just the other way round for Southern Barisano, there is an overt marking for the singular one but not for the plural. For the plural it gets dropped. And in Swahili, there are phonologically two different forms, also two different morphemes. Okay? Um, so, in this case, the singular has a key marker and the plural has a V marker. So, this is a different kind of affixation. 
and finally in mandarin we do not see any difference. So, man is ren and, uh, and men is also ren. So, what does it say? The fourth type or the or the mandarin type is primarily um, related to the zero affix form. So, how then the question arises how do we find out which one is plural which one is singular just by looking at the words given here ren could be man ren could be men. But then the concern here is it is not about just the words rather it is about the way it has been used in the context. You can easily find out from the context itself uh, the way it agrees with the verb can can help you to find out whether this is a singular uh, noun or a plural noun. Um, the, the example I can give um, let us say sheep right. So, when I say the sheep are grazing that means I am considering it as a as, as the plural form right. Um, but when I say the ship is sailing where the plural would be ships in that sense. So, here you can say that the way it agrees with the uh, with the with the um, predicate or with the verb can help you to identify the singular or the plural property of um, of the morpheme. So, um, you could you could see now overt affix at least in Latin and in Swahili also in southern Barasano with a different order with a different form. In this case the singular marker the singular uh, noun has a marker has an overt marker, but the plural noun does not have. But in the uh, in case of mandarins or, or sorry in, in case of languages like mandarin the affixes are 0 affixes as far as pluralization is concerned ok. So, um, now the, the what, what are we supposed to understand when we are trying to uh, when we are trying to represent um, in a simplistic manner what is an overt aff affix and what is a 0 affix. So, in case of the overt affix so, um, when we are trying to understand the typological difference between the overt and the zero affix simplistically we can put it in this um, this way. When the affix is overt if we do the binary division form would get 1 meaning would also get 1. When it is zero affixes form would get 0, but meaning would get uh, uh, 1. So, here I will write I will do a bit of uh, um, writing work here. So, this is the binary division and uh, why we would call it a binary division. So, um, what what my uh, concern here is that when when I when I am talking about the overt versus zero affixes I am going to put it in the binary division. So, uh, considering it is binary division we will give either 1 or we are going to give um, 0 ok. So, now let us do the um, do the division of the overt versus zero ones. When it is overt when the affix is overt meaning is also getting 1 form is also getting 1. How do how to explain this let us look at the um, example in Latin when it is oxer that is wife and when it is oxores that is wives. So, this E s E s has been overtly manifested. So, it is getting 1 for um, for, for the form and it is also getting 1 for the meaning because the meaning is also getting changed because of the presence of this affix. In case of mandarin obviously, the meaning is changed because when it is singular it indicates 1 like quantity 1 when it is plural it indicates quantity 2. So, it is going to be for the meaning part it is getting 1, but for the form part there is no such distinction ok. So, that is how uh, we are going to write uh, when you think about. So, this would be mandarin and this would be let us say latin. So, typologically these are the two different categories when you are thinking about when we are trying to discuss overt and zero affixes. Now, my question for you would be can you think about um, your own language and how does pluralization work. Do you think you have overt affixes or you have zero affixes or there are certain instances where the plural affix is overt there are certain in, in, uh, uh, instances where it is zero. So, there are three different types uh, that we that we can have let us say language A, 
would have only overt, language B will have only covert or only Z, I will write, language C could be either O or Z. So, these are the three possible types which emerge when we are thinking about morphological typology. Besides that, um, if you look at the manifestation uh, differences, you can also find out um, languages like Barasano, Southern Barasano, where um, the singular morphem actually is overtly manifested, but not the plural one. And in case of Swahili, there is a separate morphem for singular, there is a separate morphem for plural. So, now see how you are trying to do or how you can actually find out a lot of uh, um, inferences or a lot of types when you are thinking about morphological divisions or the morphological typology. Okay? So, um, at least one instance we have here the Swahili example where you can see the morpho morphological as well as the phonological features, they together decide the singular versus plural markers. So, um, there are instances where only the morphology takes care of the work, there are instances where both the um, morphological division and the phonological division that decides whether the uh, argument is going to be singular or plural. Okay? So, with this uh, um, difference in the um, overt versus zero affixes, now let us see what are the cross linguistic differences in the order of morphem. So, when I say um, cross linguistic differences have here I am primarily talking about cross linguistic differences in the order of morphemes. Okay? All these uh, let us say prefixes, suffixes or and uh, let me tell you it is already written there. So, all this data that I have got it from this book introduction to um, or introducing language typology or you can say introduction to language and uh, linguistics um, by Erith Morabsik published by Cambridge University Press. Okay? So, we will see when we are talking about the cross linguistic differences, what kind of cross linguistic differences we are looking for or we are trying to find out. The cross linguistic differences here are related to the order of morphemes. Right. So, whether the prefixes they come first and then the suffixes or the other way around or they are attached together there is an infix. So, considering there are different kinds of uh, prefixes and suffixes or, or for that matter to put it on a in a broader term um, affixes. So, how we are going to talk about or how we are going to find out the cross linguistic generalization. So, we will start um, analyzing or we will we'll try to observe some data. Uh, from different languages like English to begin with, because that is the language we consider as the lingua franca and then most of my examples are going to be from there. Then we have a language like Hungarian, then we have Tagalog and then we have a language like Kikyu, right? Kikuyu, all right. So, um, all right. So, now let us see how the uh, affixes are, are organized here, how they are sequenced within a word. So, this is, this is the um, question that we have in uh, have in hand. So, the question here is how are the affixes sequenced within the word, right. So, this is the question that we are going to discuss in a few minutes. In case of English, uh, what we see in most of the cases, the ordinal, the like the ordinal marker that was shown to be suffix, let us say tenth. So, T H is the ordinal marker, all right. Fifth or let us say um, T N then T H. So, this is the ordinal marker, right. So, this ordinal marker generally happens um, as the as the or in the suffix position that is after the root word, but in case of male it is generally a prefix form. Okay? So, there is a typological difference here, in some cases the affix is occurring at the end of the word or after the root morphem and the other one uh, the other language like male it is happening at the beginning of the word or before the root word. So, 
how do we find out a typological uh, pattern or is it is it actually possible to find out a typological pattern when you are thinking about or when when you are discussing um, the order of morphemes um, in case of morphological typology right um, and let us let us look at the examples here forget about or like keep, let us keep aside the ordinal markers for a while um, and then we um, will we'll come back to it later if you have time but otherwise now here for the moment we are going to focus on different other kinds of words. My I would like to um, have your attention on the examples given here compare Hungarian with English. So, let us look at the English word impatient right and check the Hungarian word for that. Look at the English word impossible and check the Hungarian word for that and what do you find how is the difference oh sorry how is the difference how is it uh, typologically or or this kind of um, affixation is different Hungarian affixation for this word is different from English type affixation. Um, no wonder it has been highlighted. So, here uh, we have written or, or the, the data is given um, the word for patience and the word for probable. Um, so, when it is impatient im is the prefix in case of Hungarian et len so that is the suffix and the word for patience is this tureleim if I can read it correctly pardon me I am not an Hungarian I am not a Hungarian speaker. So, uh, this is the root word and etilin is the is the suffix in case of English impatient im is the prefix similar is the case with improbable probable is the root word im is the prefix and valos zinu whatever and tlen tlen is the suffix right. So, uh, in this case you can see the same kind of like these morphemes be it m or tlen they their function is same their meaning is same and what is the meaning they are primarily um, it is it is the antonym they are making the antonym of the root word. So, if patient is the uh, patient impatient impatient is the antonym of patient probable improbable improbable is the antonym of probable. So, what function does the, the morphem im play here im is the antonym marker right or it, it changes the meaning of the word entirely in that sense. So, diametrically opposite meaning. So, im and etlen they are similar kind of morphemes, but im is a prefix and tlen is a suffix. Now, come to um, the second category which is uh, related to um, the, the like how, uh, how the adjective becomes noun. So, when it is in English we have beautiful and in Tagalog there is maganda something like that and in oily it is malangus right. So, what kind of a morphem is full here in English beautiful? So, full is a suffix and what kind of a morphem is oily oily e like y morphem that is also suffix. So, when a noun becomes an adjective we see the morphemes are attached at the end of the word. So, these are the suffixes. In case of Tagalog it is just the other way around. In this case the morphem is attached before the root word. So, that is the difference between English and Tagalog. Similar kind of difference we also um, see in the third example, example number C. So, English and Kikuyu, so teachers that is a plural marker, buyers again the plural marker. So, S is the plural marker in both words and in both instances these are suffixes. In case of uh, Kikuyu, um, A is the plural marker, but they are used before the word. So, they are prefixes. So, here um, what is the pattern that we um, that we found out? Um, the concern here is that or, or you need to remember the morpheme order is variable not only across languages, but also language internally as English shows. So, that means the the what is the take home the concern or our understanding should be something like this first thing ok uh, this, the asterisk is not a good um, um, symbol. So, let us say uh, this is what you need to remember. So, the order of the morpheme is not uniform across languages ok. So, this is what you need to remember is variable. So, this variability is not found 
only across languages, but also within languages is, odd, uh, is variable both across languages and within languages okay? and within languages or language internally you can say that within languages. So, this is what you need to remember. Look at look at the English example. So, the like across languages the differences are highlighted English versus Hungarian. In English it is prefix in Hungarian it is suffix, but even within English we have both prefixes and suffixes and uh, also a, a, a word like uneducated. Let us say I am going to write the word uneducated. In this case what is the root word? Can you think about what is the main word? That is educate. Ed is the suffix, un is the prefix, right. So, that means there are instances, it is it's, it's not very uh, clear to identify whether or to identify the pattern that this is how it works. There could be languages which allow only suffixes, there could be languages which allow only prefixes, there could be languages which allow, um, okay, there could be languages which allow only prefixes, there could be languages which allow um, only uh, suffixes and there could be languages which allow both. And besides that we uh, also have um, other kind of affixes like infixes, where you cut open like you, you are inserting another morpheme within the word. So, this is also another typological feature or this is also another um, typology of affix. So, I will not spend much time on this slide, I would, um, I would like to have a look at it. Um, how does infixing work? Uh, and infixation is not a very common phenomenon in world's languages, at least languages like Kartu and Agta, I think these are spoken in African uh, countries, some of the African countries, I will get back to you, um, let me check it again. Um, so, in this case you see, let us do the analysis of the data or I think that the language is spoken in the Philippines. So, um, look at the data here, when you say gap, that means to cut, that is the Kartu data, right. And Gyanap becomes scissors. So, something to cut and something uh, which is going to be scissor, something to shoot and something which is crossbow, something to sweep and the instrument used for sweeping is broom. So, this is the this is the verb, the left side gap, pan and p, so something like that. So, these are the, um, these are what? On the left you have the verbs, on the right you have the nouns which do that verb or which do that verb, these are the action verbs, cut, shoot, sweep, these are the action verbs and on the right with the insertion of infix like an, they become what? They become the instruments which um, like the instruments with which we do that work, right. Similar is the case with another language like agtha, here you see the verbs are gafutan, hulutan, so that is grab and follow and uh, when it becomes past tense grabbed and followed, you see the insertion of um, an infix in. So, the data that you have in hand here and could be uh, an infix and in could be an infix. So, this is one type of affix. So, when we are talking about typology of affix or typology of affixes, we had the zero morpheme, we had the overt morpheme, then the overt morpheme uh, can also have different kinds of um, types. Sometimes it could be prefixes, sometimes it could be suffixes, sometimes it could like both the prefixes and suffixes they can occur together and then we can also have infixes. The next category which very quickly I am going to talk about is the circumfixing and in the circumfixing what happens? This is also not really um, a very commonly found um, linguistic phenomenon. So, something like infixing, so circumfixing is also not uh, much like not much widely available, right. Look at the data, so this is the language. Um, Chikaso and then there is other language that we have is Russian. So, these two languages they have the circumfixation, right. So, what does it mean? So, when I say um, circumfixation, the question comes here is that 
when look at the data then we can easily understand what is happening here in case of the uh, circumfection. So, chokma I think that means he is good and in the second one ik chok o chok o that is he is not good. So, how the circumfixing is different from infixing? In the infixing what you are doing you are breaking the word into two parts and you are inserting the infix into it. In case of circumfixing you are primarily breaking the morpheme itself one part of the morpheme is used before the root word one part of the morpheme is used after the root word. So, can you identify what is the circumfixion in um, uh, in, in uh, let us say what is the circumfix in Chikasa that is mainly eco and in eco you see ik is at the beginning of the word and o is at the end of the word right. Similar is the case with uh, Russian uh, in this case also uh, this means to wait for a long time with success. So, this is do and za. So, do would be one part and za would be the other side right. So, considering the morpheme itself has been broken into two parts and remember these are not free morphemes, these are bound morphemes which are not supposed to be broken further. However, this is a special category of affix in which we see the like th this morpheme has been uh, broken into two parts and one part is used at the beginning the other part is used in the end. So, that is also another reason uh, sorry another type of affix. Um, circumfixes are also found in German as the data shows here. Um, so, this is get so uh, that means settled and written uh, you see g e like the one part of the morpheme g uh, would be on the other side and ter would be on the other side uh, on the um, end like uh, ter, um, the ter the ter morpheme or the ter part of the morpheme is at the end and g e part of the morpheme is at the beginning. Um, and how we would know that this is a circumfix? you need to compare the German data um, A and B. So, when it is uh, when you are deleting the term marker the word becomes unacceptable. So, without ter since this is unacceptable we call G E T together as a as a circumfix ok. Yeah, so, you can follow it uh, the look at the example and then you can easily um, understand that. Hebrew has a different kind of uh, morpheme altogether. Um, after the circumfixing the next type of affix that we have uh, here is Hebrew. So, what happens in Hebrew um, this is the third order pattern. First we had what let us let us try to um, figure out the first order pattern was affixation or, or you can say prefix or suffix. The second order pattern is infixation the um, and then the third order pattern is going to like then we had the uh, circumfixes uh, circumfixation or you can call it circumfix and now we have the introfix. I think I made some mistake in ordering this um, ok let me let me repeat prefix and suffix we are keeping it together that comprises of one category right and then we had infix which is not so of, of all the um, rare forms of affixation first category is infixing, second category is, uh, is circumfixing and the third category is introfixing. So, these are all not much commonly found types in affix. So, in introfixing what happens um, look at the data I, and it is very interesting this is this data comes from Hebrew. Here look at the Hebrew word for read and look at the Hebrew word for make read. Look at the Hebrew word for dance and the Hebrew word for make dance and Hebrew word for borrow and then Hebrew word for lend that means to make borrow or something like that right. Here not only the, um, the affix is broken into two parts, but also the main word that has been broken and then some part of the main word is also missing. So, uh, if you check the if you check the the data carefully it will be easier for you. I think the simplest data um, you should um, you should figure out or you should analyze is the second one. Um, if I can read it correctly I apologize for um, in advance for the wrong pronunciation. So, this is Rackard 
uh, in, in case of rack card when that is dance and when it becomes make dance it becomes her kid. So, in that case so what is the uh, what is the interfix here is he. So, he one part of h i like one part of he that is h i is kept in the beginning of the word then the other one only e sound that or e only the, the e marker or the e morphem part of the morphem that is there in the middle of the word. And in case of rakad which was the root word that has also uh, been broken and then th there has been some change. So, we have r q and d, but then the vowel sound has been uh, so vowel sound that is r sound that has been dropped. Similar is the case with first one and the third one. So, primarily what happens in the interfixing? Now, let us um, sort of wind it up. In case of uh, interfixing, what we do? We see both the so this is what I think I need to explain it a bit, otherwise it will be difficult for you. So, um, interfixing what it does. it breaks ok I am using this hashtag symbol. Um, this breaks the morphem as well as root word plus what else vowel are dropped. Two things are happening here in case of um, interfixing right and Hebrew is the right example for that. So, look at follow these rules and look at um, the, the data that we have. These are the three linear arrangement of affixes relative to the stem. So, what are the three patterns here? Since we are talking about uh, um, the, the typological organizing or the typological organization of, uh, of patterns. So, let us see um, how does it work when we are when we are thinking about um, the typology of affixes. So, three types we are getting. The first type is preceding, second type is following and the third type is interlocking right. So, these three types are important to understand morphological typology. When it is preceding would be what prefixes ok right and when it is uh, uh, following it will be suffixes. When it is interlocking either it could be infixes or it could be circumfixes or it could be introfixes. So, this, partic this particular uh, box summarizes everything um, as far as morphological typology is concerned. So, either you see affixes that precede the main word or the root word or you see the uh, affixes which follow the main word or you can see the affixes which get interlocked and in case of interlocking either they can be infixes, they can be circumfixes or they can be um, introfixes. Mm -hmm.